Now in the first session, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome Kristen Pudence and Ned Allen from Lockheed Martin, who uh, will speak on open mathematical questions to illuminate quantum machine learning. And I believe that Kristen will speak first. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Richard, for the introduction. I'm pleased to be part of this speaker series. Um, it was, it's all, always lovely for an engineer to be called trendy for the topics of discussion that I bring, although I suppose it's, it's mathematically trendy, so maybe that's, that's different than other kinds of trendy there may be. Uh, yeah, good morning to any other Americans on the line. Good afternoon to anyone in a more transatlantic setting. The topic that we'll be addressing today is open mathematical questions in quantum machine learning. So I thought it was interesting when the IMA asked Ned and I to give this talk because quantum computing, while at its root deep, is deeply mathematical, um, we often address it from a practical setting. But in, in, in fact, there are many things that um, the mathematics community can, communi can contribute to quantum machine learning and other topics in quantum computing that are of, of deep and uh, lasting value. So my aim with this talk is to show some of the places within quantum machine learning specifically where there may be space for, for the math community to contribute. And there may be some really interesting things that, that we can look at together. So I'm, I'm asking you all for a little bit of help, or at least I will be at the end. So let's start out by talking about machine learning. In the classical context, this is um, advanced modeling of data based on previous observations rather than a well-defined model, right? So uh, I'm sure you've all heard the saying that if you get a model with enough free parameters, you can, you can fit anything at all to it and your, your model it's, it's often used to, to say that if you have too many free parameters in your model, you, your model is useless, but machine learning sort of flips that concept on its head. And it says, well, what kind of models can we construct that are generalized in the, enough that if we just feed them a lot of data from observations from you know, different types of, of problems that, that we may encounter in the world, that the machine itself can develop the model and you know, assign its own free parameters. And at the output, you'll, you'll learn something about the problem you're trying to address. The two types of models that are often posed to machine learning um, with, with machine learning algorithms are supervised and unsupervised learning. And the distinction between the two is really based on the type of data that you put into the model. So supervised learning requires a labeled data set. You can think of it as teaching the computer with somebody who knows the answers, right? So the, the computers may be doing a worksheet and it hands it back to the teacher and the teacher says, well, you know, you got about 80% of them right, but I'm, I'm confident that you can learn and you can do better next time and you can adjust your model in, inside your, your processor and we'll, um, we'll do an optimization that will get you closer to the, the right answers next time I feed you a set of problems to which I also know the answer. And then one day we'll launch you out into the career in the world and nobody will know the answers, but you'll, you'll still do pretty well anyway. Unsupervised learning is just sort of throwing somebody in, you know, this is what, what often happens in the professional world. You throw somebody into a field and you say, okay, well, here's everything. Things are happening. Data is coming in and you need to discern patterns in it. You need to find out what's going on with it and you need to learn to handle it yourself. 
So unsupervised learning methods often include clustering, so you, the, the computer tries to find data points that would sit close together in some data space that it defines. Sometimes you transform the data to see if it clusters in a different space better than the space in which it's initially presented. And nobody supplies the correct answers. But unsupervised learning is often quite interesting because you try to, you can, you can learn things, or at least you think you learn things. You can find correlations, if not necessarily causation, in um, how a large set of data relates to itself and, and sits within itself. Within these general categories of supervised and unsupervised learning, there are a lot of approaches. And it, it depends on what kind of characteristics you think your data may have, if you know in advance, or what you're trying to achieve with your machine learning algorithm, what sort of approach you might have. The approach we're looking at today is uh, neural networks. So neural networks are these layered structures. Um, each layer is composed of artificial neurons that are really just variables. And the capacity of a neural network grows with the number of layers you put into it. Um, the, I, when I say capacity, I mean it's capacity to contain complexity and to contain interesting patterns. Machine learning is very popular these days. You know, it was um, first proposed quite some time ago. It was interesting at that time, but there was not enough computer power to implement it. Then there was the famous AI winter. But in recent years, with the large parallel processing capacity that, that we've developed, um, it's become possible to attack quite large data sets with machine learning. And you can apply it to classification. So that's assigning up, uh, pieces of data to different categories, data compression, uh, clustering we already discussed, and feature recognition, like finding the face in an image for, it, for example. Um, the whole world's talking about machine learning. There's a lot of interesting things happening. So here, here's an example of a neural network. Here's sort of a, a simple diagram of of what the structure might look like for a, a low depth neural network. So on the, on the left side, you see an input layer and the input layer, that's the, the red circles and that's the problem data. It's expressed as a binary string. So every circle in this diagram is a binary variable. And that's, that's just a set of ones and zeros. Okay, fine, we can get problem data, that's very good. And then in the middle, we have another layer, and that's a hidden layer. And this is sort of where the magic happens within a neural network. This is the innards of the processing that are visible to the people training the network um, and operating it, but that um, sort of form, form the, the inner part of the brain and you know the, the processing that completes the worksheet because most neural networks are trained in a supervised way. So the, the blue variables in the middle, the circles, they also represent binary variables and they take their value based on an activation function. So you have to define some function that says, okay, well, based on the input variables that feed into this hidden layer and they connect to this hidden, um, variable, at what point does it become a one rather than a zero? Uh, at what point does it, does it activate itself and, and propagate forward to the next layers in the network? So we talk about um, you know, the, the variables in the activation function are the input layer and also the weight and pruning of the connections to neighboring layers. So you see in the upper right corner, I've got the connections labeled in the neural network too, and that's all these arrows. So this is a feed forward neural network, which means that all the arrows are pointing towards the right, towards the, the output direction of the network. 
And you also see that the connections happen between the layers rather than within the layers. So we're always, we're always pushing forward in the, the data that we have. These connections between the layers can have a weight. So you, you, part of the training is deciding how important they are, right? So um, the structure of neural networks is often sort of obscure and inscrutable, but sometimes you can identify hidden variables that, that have a particular characteristic or correspond to a particular, you know, something that's happening with the data. So some input variables are more important to certain hidden nodes than others, so they would have a higher weight on the connection between the input and the hidden nodes. Uh, the process of assigning weights and clearing out low weight connections is called pruning in the process of training the neural network. So the, the weight and the existence of these, of these connections is also an important part of the activation function. You may have an activation function that just says, you know, if the sum of the input variables times the weights of the, of the connections to the hidden variables exceeds a certain threshold, then the hidden variable activates. That's one very simple way to handle this. We've covered the rest of the hidden layer points, I think. Um, this feed-forward structure and the connections is the most common. Classical neural networks can also have feedback possible, but it's, it's a more difficult training process. And there's a lot of things you can do with feed-forward neural networks, so there's a lot of focus put, put there for now. Finally, we get to the output layer, which is these green variables. It's the final set of neurons. And it is usually set up to contain some sort of meaning to the neural network. Otherwise, you know, why did you build the network in the first place? Well, you could say if it's if the output neurons are are not meaningful, are not human readable, um, if you give them that freedom, you might just treat them as a compressed representation of the data. And that's okay too. But often the output neurons are things like a set of classifications. So if you put a set of images into the neural network in binary form, then in the output, you might have a set of variables that say, okay, well, this one's a dog and this one's a car and this one's a person. And you try to distinguish between them in this way. And those are, those are the labels that in turn you teach the neural network with. So what's this classical neural network really made of? And this, this will become important in a, in a minute when we uh, compare it to what we can do with, with quantum computing technology. Well, the classical neural network is made of classical circuits, right? So here's on the bottom, here's a picture from an online textbook in, in machine learning. It's actually quite nice. And it's a, it's a set of NAND gates that implement a very simple neural network. So you've, you've got, you can see sort of the input structure and the layers that exist and the gates that, that are um, implementing the connections and the activation functions for the, for the neurons. So if we take this to a more abstract level, uh, as it would be appropriate mathematically, the components of a classical network are, are bits and classical gates representing the no nodes in the lay the neurons and the connections re respectively you can store binary strings at each step of the network and the gates and the functions that are available to process it are your your standard circuits right your and or not um, things like this and so the limitations you get from here are the um you know, I already mentioned that feedback training is difficult. A common way to train a feedforward neural network is called back propagation. And it actually involves sampling from, from, the, um, from the distribution that is produced by the neural network. And that's a hard problem classically. 
And you might ask, well, why, why does it involve sampling? And it's, it's this checking the worksheet process that I alluded to, right? So um, when you train the neural network, you um, push it forward and you look at what answers it gives, you want a whole set of possible answers that it, that it may give to a, to a given problem. You want to explore the space of at least um, highly probable solutions you get from your data. And so you need to sample from, from the, the distribution that it, that it produces in order to be able to train the network and give the next iteration of the weights for the connections. Despite these limitations, classical machine learning is extremely powerful. Um, we have excellent classical computers to do the work. They're cheap, they're ubiquitous. Uh, we're doing a lot with big data. You can see it in the news every day. And it's increasingly the basis for a lot of how our, our online world operates. So now what about quantum computing? You know, machine learning is kind of trendy. Quantum computing is also kind of trendy. What happens if we smash them together? Well, let's, let's first talk about quantum computing and then we'll talk about the intersection of the two. So what's, what's distinguishing a quantum computer from a classical computer? And in, in this context, from a mathematical perspective, I would say that the, the states and the gates that are available to a quantum computer are fundamentally distinct from the states and gates that are available for a classic, classical computer. So in, in Hilbert space, um, we're going to build our neural network from, instead of binary states, we're going to use qubit states. Um, the, that live in this, this more continuous space. So instead of a zero or a one, you can have a combination of, of a zero or one. I've written some sample states um, along the line there. There's a single qubit state psi first, and there's a, there's a multi-qubit state or a register state that would be a whole layer of the network, um, psi uh, written second. And then you connect them using unitary gates. So instead of these, these classical gates that you have available for a conventional neural network, you've got different gates that, that are available. Um, anything in the, in the unitary space will also will keep the, the processing within the Hilbert space. So you're, you're allowed to do that in a quantum computer. So in the, in the gate model of quantum computation, you apply a series of discrete unitaries to a set of qubits that, that, that you have predefined. Um, and each discrete time step, you could, you could consider it as one step in the, in the processing of a neural network. Uh, you've just got quantum gates in there instead of classical gates. Advantages that we know this can provide is that when you store data in a Hilbert space instead of a binary space, you get a logarithmic improvement in data storage because you can use these alpha and beta degrees of freedom, although you have to be very careful how you get the information back out when you, when you collapse it down from the, from the Hilbert space state and bring it back out, expand it. Uh, and then you've got this, this interesting thing that's happening, you know, the, um, that's called entanglement. And this is the capacity to build states in the Hilbert space that are strongly correlated between the, the qubits. So an example of this is the EPR state, right? You've got two qubits and you know they're both in the zero state or both in the one state, but they're not, they're, their states are not different than each other. So if you measure one of them, you get the value of the other two. Um, this is what bothered Einstein. He called it spooky action at a distance. And in fact, he's the, the E and the EPR. It's Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. They, they proposed these states as, uh, you know, something that was going to be problematic for quantum mechanics. But in, instead, they're, they're actually one of the most interesting things that happens 
uh, particularly when we can control and use them. So what this means for neural networks probably is that this is a novel form of correlation between the variables in the, in the layers that's not available classically, right? This is a, a whole different kind of connection that's not necessarily an activation function. It persists um, even sort of while you've got these intermediate states going on and you're going to have to deal with it in, in the end when you measure, you're going to collapse the state down to choose this one of these um, options, the zero, zero, or the one, one. So there's a lot of potential there at, that I don't think has been fully explored as to, to how you could use it. Um, the, the potential downsides I've listed here have to do with, with practical implementations of quantum computing. Um, you know, you, you've got, when you try to bring this to the real world, you, maybe you have to make a quantum memory to get this logarithmic improvement in data storage. That's hard. Um, maybe you've got a certain gate set instead of just space of unitary gates that's easy for you to implement and you have to think about that too. But uh, let's, not, let's not worry about that for the time being. We're, we're in a mathematical world. Let's give ourselves the mathematical freedom that exists. So another model of quantum computation. So the, the, the resources I talked about are really framed in the context of the gate model, which is building a quantum computer like you would build a classical computer. You step by step, you have some kind of state in the, in the variables that you have have available to you and you you apply a series of discrete gates to process that state. Quantum annealing is actually a form of uh, continuous process for, for quantum states. So you, you always begin in the same state or uh, in, at least in practical implementations that have been constructed state, you, you always begin in the same state. You can define some algorithms that may begin in different states and there's, there's interesting things to be explored there too, but maybe not today. Um, and then you, you continuously adjust the control variables you have for your physical system that embodies a quantum processor until at the end, uh, you've changed the system Hamiltonian, you've changed what's happening on, in your physical processor, and you've changed it to become an, a function whose ground state embodies the solution to the computational problem you would like to solve. So if you look at this graph that's at the bottom of the screen, you're going to follow the ground state all the way through the computation. The vertical axis here is energy. The horizontal axis is time. You move from time equals zero to the completion of the algorithm um, along the ground state even though the identity of the ground state is changing. So the, the, if you measure it at any given time, you may get a different binary string out uh, due to the change in the physical parameters of the system. So this is, this is like analog quantum computation. It's been around for quite a while now. Uh, P-Wave makes commercial processors implementing this sort of system. So people have put neural networks on these commercial quantum annealing processors, and it's quite interesting to see what they found. You know, on the on the left side, you see a diagram that looks very much like the diagram of the neural network we saw at the beginning. Um, you can put that. Uh, the the middle picture is a is a diagram of how that can be put on a quantum annealing processor, specifically one that that is is accessible, and you can test these problems on. So you've, you've got this bipartite connection that occurs. And then on, on the far right is, this is a, a graph of the results. And I know, I know the, the uh, labels on these axes, axes are tiny. Um, but on the vertical axis of these graphs, you've got a percent correct. So uh, a higher value here is better. And on the right, you've got the number of training iterations that you do with this neural network. And the left graph is classical, the right graph is quantum. So the story here is that for fewer training iterations, uh, 
all right, my, my colleague at Lockheed Martin actually is, is the person who did this work. He and, and uh, his collaborator found that um, for fewer training iterations, the quantum neural network was more accurate, so faster. So this is sort of a speed up and or quality improvement in the training of the neural network. So this is this is nice. This is a Boltzmann machine. Um, the comment I should make about it is that further investigation has sort of found that the magic in this may be the algorithm that my colleague used and not the um, not the invocation of the quantum processor, but this is one route to train neural networks with quantum annealing. Uh, another route is to look at them in a more generalized context. So after this work came out, um, the tests that were done in the previous work and in this paper that I'm talking about were done over the set of uh, MNIST digits. So a team at NASA did an extension of the work and they did what they call a Helmholtz machine. Well, everybody calls it a Helmholtz machine in the quantum machine learning community. And you, the difference between the Boltzmann and the Helmholtz machine is rather than having connections only between the layers, you can have connections within the layers as well. And the idea here is that Helmholtz machines are much more difficult to do processing for classically, but if you have access to a quantum machine that will do the sampling for you, uh, the computationally difficult bit, then you can, you can explore things that have a different structure. So, so what they found is that they were able to, you know, the, these digits on the top were generated by um, actually operating the neural network backwards and seeing what it generated and the the corresponding digits from the training center on the bottom so they they had seen you know, some reasonable success replicating the digits it's not always perfect if you look on the bottom row fourth from the right for instance you can see a digit from the training set that was a zero um, became an eight after it sort of passed back and forth through the neural network but this is this is also something interesting you can do with quantum annealing and i think with quantum annealing um, not all the structures of neural networks that are interesting have been explored and there's there's space to to try some new things there and to think about some new potential for what would be fruitful to do with quantum annealing um, but you know we we talked about gate or circuit model quantum computing earlier, you start with a state, you go through these set of gates, you measure the output, and that, that becomes your, your neural network. So we can construct a framework for neural networks that's more similar to the classical method if we return to the, to the gate model. And that, that looks like this. So here's our little baby neural network again, right? So your input layer, is this quantum state instead of a classical state your hidden layer is a um, is also a, a quantum state and the the interesting thing about the hidden layer is that your neuron can be partially activated right you have these alpha and beta terms on zero and one so you can have a superposition state is what this is called in quantum computing and there's no classical analog for this uh, you can, it's sort of a, it's a continuous property of the space in which the qubits live. So that's, that's something that, that's an extension beyond the classical. And then there's, there's entanglement, which we talked about earlier. So that's, that's a correlation that doesn't appear on this chart and would be difficult to draw on it. You could entangle all of the neurons in the hidden layer, or you could entangle just a subset of them, and you could, you know, entangle some a little bit more than others. And this is this is sort of this is something that will live within the state of each layer of the neural network. And between the combination of superposition and entanglement, the state of each individual hidden layer in a quantum neural network such as this is far, far more complex than the state, the binary state of a, of a classical neural network. So there's tremendous potential there, I think, 
for representations of data that exceed what's possible classically. The connections between the layers are implemented with the unitary gates. So you can access, uh, you can access activation functions that would not be possible classically. Uh, you can do things like you can, your unitary gate could be an entangling gate. So you can create one of these novel correlations while moving between layers. And this, this poses a whole new world of interesting potential for um, connecting the layers. And it also poses a whole new set of difficulties probably in, in processing and training and trying to do your something, something analogous to back propagation in a manner that's efficient and that will, will get you, will enable you to learn something from the data that you're, that you're working with. Finally, you have the output layer. And when you, when you have your output layer, you're gonna need to read it out. So when you read it out to, and presumably you're gonna read it out to the classical world because some human's gonna look at it or you wanna feed it into a uh, classical computer system. So when you look at your output layer, um, the basis of readout will be very important. You've got options when you're reading out a quantum state, right? So we've defined this the zero and one state, and that's that's one way in which the variable can be read. But you can you can actually read it out. Um, you can define the basis vectors of that quantum state that you have differently, and you can read it out in that that basis instead. And that's kind of like looking at the physical variable from a from a different direction. And there are good reasons to do this sometimes. If you think there may be correlations that don't sit in the, in the basis you were originally fed the data in, you can get things like, um, you can get commonalities between qubits. You can get the readout in the, for instance, the EPR basis instead of the computational basis. And then, then you, you know which things are entangled and you, you get that um, with 100% fidelity. So this degree of freedom in mapping back to the classical state is another thing you could take advantage of in a well-designed quantum neural network. And really, I guess what I want to communicate is that there is so much here and the gate model quantum machines are at such an early stage of development currently that I don't think we've even explored a small fraction of what could be accomplished. And I think there's a lot of room for the mathematical community to look at the potential for data representation with these additional resources that are available from a gate model cl uh, classical machine and see, try to see what's happening there. So some open questions that, that I've had, um, that I've, I've written down from, from the structure is, you know, what neural networks structures have been neglected in classical machine learning? Um, and could they have a modeling advantage? And this is, this is related to the annealing work I showed you. Uh, can quantum annealing facilitate the training of enhanced classical neural networks? Um, beyond the logarithmically compressed representation of data, so your neural network becomes more compact, um, what other things about these quantum building blocks give you an enhanced capability? And where could you see taking advantage of it? What's really the meaning of the partially activated neuron? How can it help us? Can we give a formal treatment of all this that would um, guide implementation of algorithms that operate quantum neural networks in an efficient way? And what are the limits on our ability to train these more complex structures? Where are we gonna run up against computational walls because we're dealing with states of such complexity and richness that attacking them with the uh, even the quantum computer is going to be difficult for us. So, you know, some of these questions, of course, people have thought about them before. There are a couple of nice review articles 
are referenced at the bottom of the page if you if you want to get started. But this is these are some of the things that that I think about. Um, these are some of the things that I think are are really interesting questions. So that's that's sort of what I have to say about this the topic. And I think um, Ned had a few additional points that he wanted to contribute to this the discussion as well. So I'll leave it with him for the final slide. So uh, all that I wanted to uh, do was emphasize some of the things that Kristen brought up in her talk. And in, in particular, um, the, the, uh, she mentioned this idea of entanglement, which is a different kind of correlation that is actually um, not, um, not all that comprehensible to people familiar with classical statistics. Um, but it's uh, the, the um, uh, it sort of implies that uh, quantum machine learning can uh, greatly enlarge, and this uh, Kristen made this point, I just want to emphasize it, greatly enlarge the kinds of things we can learn using machine learning. And uh, this assertion follows immediately from uh, a theorem of John Bell, who, um, in spite of being an Irishman, actually spoke English, you know, so um, he, um, I think of him as part of a English uh, a tradition, but he, um, uh, his paper written uh, the year I graduated from college actually was perhaps uh, after the two papers on relativity by Einstein, the single most important paper in physics in the 20th century in which he, uh, he derived and maintained this distinction between um, quantum correlations or quantum um, um, uh, so, uh, quantum interactions and classical uh, uh, probabilistic uh, correlations. And it's that that makes uh, quantum computing uh, so interesting, that there's much more we can learn with uh, quantum computers way beyond what you can do with a classical computer. And that's among the most interesting things in uh, industrial applications. So with, with that, I'll quit. I just meant to um, sort of emphasize that uh, aspect of quantum machine learning for, for everyone as a way to kick off the discussion. So, um, in which case, um, thank you very much uh, to our two speakers. Uh, just take a, a moment to show our appreciation for the talk. Um, and now uh, we do have um, about 10 minutes for question and answers. I'm going to uh, make use of the um, cha chair's privilege to ask the first question. Um, and it goes actually to a comment that was made by both speakers towards the end about the relative power of quantum machine learning versus classical machine learning. Um, do, should we expect that uh, quantum machine learning is capable of learning things that in principle could not be done by a classical neural network? Or yes, is the advantage absolutely. simply in terms of much greater com computational power and speed? That's, that's an excellent question. Thank you very much for it. And the, the answer is yes. So some of, some of the work that you'll find in, in both of these review articles that, that I've, I'm showing at the bottom of the slide here is in the field of machine learning of quantum states. So you take specifically quantum phenomena, you take quantum physics that, that you'd like to learn about, and um, you try to, to model it with, with, a machine, with a quantum machine learning algorithm. And you know, of course, the, the uh, 
quantum computers that are available to run these on are quite small, but the results that have been achieved today are, are promising. And I think that's an expanding segment of the field. So it's, it's very nice to model with something that fits better than trying to cram a, a quantum model into a classical machine. Um, uh, I might add to that that um, that uh, that is the fundamental attraction of quantum machine learning, that you can learn new things you couldn't otherwise learn. And that that has, we hope in the future, very significant applications, like, for example, uh, the, the COVID, the, the search for a COVID-19 um, uh, drugs to manage uh, uh, the pandemic, and um, that 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 problem ought to be entirely modeled uh, in a quantum computer. That you should be able to predict uh, the exact structure of the drug that's needed for that application, and and uh, be able to determine its safety and its effectiveness without going through uh, complex, expensive physical trials. And you could not do that with a classical machine, period. So um, it's, uh, it, uh, it, it has tremendous potential in that respect, where uh, that's the kind of thing that makes uh, quantum in machine learning so attractive. Well, thank you very much. Let me take a couple of questions from the, the, uh, the Q&A box. Um, firstly, from Gordon Hunter, who asks, who says he's uh, relatively familiar with classical neural networks and with elementary quantum physics, but not so much with quantum computing, and asks whether you can recommend a good, accessible introductory text in that topic. Um, and I think I'll follow that up by as asking, there are in fact a couple of references in rather small print on the slide in front of us. Would those answer his question or would you uh, point him in a, uh, to something uh, different to get into the subject? Sure, so the references that, I, that I've got on the slide here are specifically for quantum machine learning. Okay. But if you want to learn about quantum computation, which it sounds like this, this question is more directed toward, of course, the, the standard reference in the field is uh, Quantum Computation and Quantum Information by Nielsen and Chuang. So that's, yes, that's the one. And then there's another uh, very nice book that's um, A Gentle Introduction to Quantum Computation by Eleanor Riefel. And those are the two that I always recommend to people trying to get into the field. Thank you. Um, also in the Q&A box, uh, another very interesting question and one perhaps relevant to discussions that are taking place um, around uh, classical uh, machine learning um, in terms of interpretability and auditability. Uh, Edouard Campillo-Funelet asks, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, one limitation of classical machine learning is that it's difficult to interpret what the model and the neurons rep actually represent. Uh, how is the situation with quantum machine learning? I think the situation with quantum machine learning will be similar or perhaps even worse, right? Because the, the, the quantum states are, that are available to us in the hidden layers, while attractive because of the complexity that they represent, can, by having that complexity, be even more deep and obscure and you, you may find it more difficult to extract meaning from them. And this, this is a problem that we struggle with every day in our industry, actually, you know, working for a company that produces aircraft and things of that nature. We want our systems to be very safe. And in fact, our systems have to be certified by government authorities as safe to fly or safe to perform whatever other task that they do, right? You, you're allowed to send it up in space and it's not gonna crash on anyone, right? So if we use machine learning as part of the control or part of the design of our, of our system, sometimes that, that causes an issue for safety certification because you can't say exactly what's happening 
in inside of it and you you just have to solve that problem with more extensive testing so it's a it's a problem that i think will continue to crop up in the field but it's probably worth it for the things that we'll find out by using neural networks to represent data would you say that that was an area in which perhaps there was still um root, uh, scope for um uh, research by mathematicians as well as by engineers. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, um, we're just about on time. So, um, and I think that was a, um, a good note to end on. I'd like to repeat my thanks uh, to Kristen and to Ned for sharing with us um, a view of a subject which is um, uh, very much active and very much still providing uh, good opportunities for interaction between uh, mathematicians, scientists, engineers, and application domains, which is very much, I hope, the province of the IMA and its members. And so on that note, I would like to uh, conclude this first uh, session by thanking the speakers again.